Today we live in an unpredictable environment and news races around the world at breakneck speed. I didn't know what his intention was. I knew it could be obstruction of justice. My show brings you the latest news and top news makers. Are you playing with fire? And we also dive below the headlines to explore vital issues impacting our lives. It's about right and wrong. You have to stand up for what you believe in. We need to realize that our future is at risk and we need to take action. Was that kind of mortifying or did you enjoy I mean, you were great. <laughs> it's crucial we make sense of what's happening. Do you regret that? Do you think there should be nuclear power or more commitment to a clean environment? New Zealand had its experience and changed its laws. To be honest with you, I do not understand the United States. Does love have a chance of winning? I've always believed that. And fully understand what's at stake. Amanpour, today on CNN. I'm Linda Kincaid in Atlanta, and this is CNN. This hour, protesters bring Hong Kong's airport to a standstill for a second day running. The territory's leader warning the city is being pushed to the brink of no return. Then a CNN exclusive report on the Russian president's private army led by the man that people call Putin's chef. How is he secretly cooking up support in Africa? Plus, Jeffrey Epstein's death could mean legal trouble for his alleged co-conspirators, the latest on possible sex trafficking connections. All that and much more right here at the International Desk. Welcome, I'm Linda Kincaid. We start in Hong Kong where confrontations are erupting at the international airport as protests force dozens of flights to be cancelled for a second day. The chaos has caused frustration for travellers and some shouting matches have been going on between protesters and stranded passengers. Officials are urging customers to postpone non-essential travel through Wednesday. Well, Beijing says the protests in Hong Kong show signs of terrorism. Analysts say if you only watch Chinese state media, you'd probably agree. Our Ben Wiedemann reports. Ten weeks of protests. <laughs> Hundreds arrested. A key international airport overrun and paralyzed. Watching all this unfold, Beijing is not amused. A spokesman for China's Hong Kong and Macau office warned the protests have, in his words, begun to show signs of terrorism. The nationalist Chinese tabloid The Global Times published video of the People's Armed Police, China's federal police, deploying in Shenzhen, right on the border with Hong Kong. Two weeks before, the People's Liberation Army Hong Kong Garrison posted a video online showing troops training to deal with rioters and put out a statement stressing its determination and ability to protect Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. Hong Kong's charm status, part of China but apart from China, at the end of the day is at China's pleasure. Under the territory's garrison law, the Hong Kong government can request the intervention of the Chinese army in the event of natural disaster or civil disorder. And civil disorder is in the air. With some anger focused on symbols of the Chinese state. Chief Executive Carrie Lam has a blunt warning. Hong Kong society is not safe or stable. The rioters have pushed Hong Kong to the brink of no return. Yet armed intervention by Beijing would shatter Hong Kong's international business-friendly image and strike the death knell to the one country, two systems arrangement. Pro-Beijing legislator Holden Chow insists that doomsday scenario is, at the moment, unlikely. I don't think the PLA will come in to deal with the situation because I trust the Hong Kong police and the Hong Kong SAR government has the ability to deal with the situation here. 
Perhaps, but as protests carry on or intensify and their impact is felt well beyond this tiny, crowded territory, that could change. Ben Wieter, CNN, Hong Kong. And Paula Hancock joins us now live from Hong Kong's International Airport. And Paula, this is the second day that these protesters have effectively shut the airport down. Is there any indication that police will try to clear these protesters? Until this point, we're really not seeing a police presence here. You do see some airport security, uh, you see paramedics, but we're not seeing uh, a heavy or, in fact, any police presence. Uh, it, certainly, uh, we understand from protesters that they believe there is a police presence here. They believe there could be undercover police here. In fact, the crowd you see behind me, there's one individual within the midst of those dozens of protesters who's been there for a number of hours now. The protesters are holding him because they believe that he is. Uh, an undercover police officer. Now, there's no way of us uh, being able to, to know if that's correct or not, but it does show the anger against the police that these protesters are feeling. Yes, these protesters are still about the extradition bill uh, and wanting that to be cancelled, a potential bill uh, that could allow Hong Kongers to be extradited to be tried in China, but it has become far more wide-ranging than that now, especially since Sunday. Many more protesters coming out here, they say, because they're angry by what they see as this perceived police brutality, excessive force used uh, against protesters. Police deny that. Uh, Carrie Lam, the chief executive, denies that as well. But this is why we're seeing thousands of people here at the Hong Kong International Airport. Linda. And Paul, as you mentioned, this all began 10 weeks ago over that extradition bill, which basically would allow suspects in Hong Kong to face trial in mainland China. And although officials uh, eventually said it was dead, they didn't withdraw it. And the chief executive was again grilled on that today. Uh, what happened? Well, that's right. And that was really key for the protesters. Uh, Carrie Lam says it is effectively dead. They weren't going to carry on with that bill. But what protesters want is for it to be officially withdrawn so that they say it can't be snuck through at a later date uh, with, without uh, protesters being able to, to fight against it. Now, Carrie Lam, once again at a press conference, was asked specifically about that. Let's listen to her response. Do you, as Hong Kong's leader, have the autonomy to decide to withdraw the bill, yes or no, or is this something that Beijing has to approve as well? In other words, have your hands been tied by Beijing in not allowing the bill to be withdrawn, or is this a point of political pride on your part in not doing this and refusing to meet this demand of the protesters? Well, actually, uh, this, yes question, no. this question has been response. answered on previous occasions. But you've evaded the question one, on numerous occasions. As, uh, as we have all heard from the spokesman of the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, um, the central government is still confident that I myself, as the government of the Hong Kong SAR, together with the police force, that we are still capable of resolving this crisis. Do so the you have question, the autonomy exactly. or not the second, to withdraw the, the extradition point, bill, please? The second please. point I want to make Could you is answer in that response specific to question? the various demands that we have heard, we have considered all factors and came up with a response that we have rehearsed time and again over the last two months. Thank you very much. Do you much. have the autonomy or not to yeah. withdraw the extradition she bill? Has your question, please. You, you have not answered the question. You've Sorry. evaded the question. Avoiding the question completely there, we also know that a Beijing top official has said that they see these protests have begun to show signs of terrorism. So you're seeing uh, the language from Beijing becoming a little stronger as well as they see uh, the tenth week of these Hong Kong protests. Linda? Yeah, tenth week. It's incredible how long this has gone on. Paula Hancock, good to have you with us at the International Airport there in Hong Kong. Thank you. Well, we are learning more about the Dayton shooting that left nine people dead last weekend. The high-capacity magazine used by the shooter, as well as the body armor he wore, were both purchased for the gunman by a friend. Investigators have been talking to that friend to see what he knew about the attack, and he is now facing federal charges. Ryan Young has been following the investigation. He joins us now live. Uh, so, Ryan, 
we have heard now that the friend has admitted to providing the gunman uh, with essentially all the weaponry and the gear to carry out this massacre. Well, uh, partly, and this is the thing that they wanted to make clear. They don't believe he knew that the shooting was going to occur or what Connor Betts was actually planning. What they do know is that apparently, according to him, at least, that he was trying to help the shooter hide this equipment from his parents. Apparently, he lived at home. So you have that drum that so many people have focused on because when you see it, you can't believe someone would have this for an AR-15, an ammunition drum that holds over uh, 100 bullets, and then you have the top part of an AR-15 and that body armor. All this put together is what this person, apparently Ethan Colley, 24, had at his house. And in fact, as you listen to investigators talk about this case, this is what they had to say yesterday about what they found inside that apartment. He purchased these items for Betts and stored them at Collie's residence in order to um, assist Betts in hiding the items from Betts's parents. Mr. Collie does not stand accused of intentionally uh, participating in the planning of that shooting. We have no evidence of that. There's no allegation of that. So what, what's interesting about this is none of that is illegal. What actually kind of got him in trouble also on top of all this is the fact that he was using drugs. And when he filled out his federal firearm license, that was a part of it to get some of this stuff that he lied about using drugs. And when federal investigators showed up to his house the day after the shooting, they saw marijuana present. He also was growing mushrooms in his house and said that he had been doing drugs with this shooter for quite some time. So when you put all that together, he faces 15 years possibly in jail. Now, you, you also think about the fact that Connor Betts, the shooter, actually shot and killed his own sister, and another friend was wounded in this shooting. So many questions in this case when you have nine people dead and over 20 people injured in this. And police tell us if he was able to turn that corner and get inside that club with that ammunition drum, this could have been so much worse. But the Dayton Police Department were able to respond, surround him, and shoot and kill him before he was able to get inside there. But, of course, so many questions now laying this all out. There's one thing I do want to bring up. We learned this yesterday while they were talking at this news conference, that they've finally been able to get into his phone, Connor Betts' phone, and they're going through that. Hopefully we'll be able to find out some sort of motive sometime soon because as of right now, there's still no clue about what set him off and turned him loose on that street with all those innocent people taking that gunfire. Yeah, nine people killed in less than 30 seconds. Uh, Ryan Young, good to have you on this story. Thank you. Thank you. No well. Well, sadly, there is more gun violence to tell you about in the U.S., this time in Southern California. Take a listen. That's a shootout that started after a routine traffic stop on Monday. The driver opened fire on a highway patrol officer after being pulled over. That officer was killed. Then more gunfire was exchanged when backup arrived on the scene. The suspect died during that shootout. Two other officers were wounded. Officials don't know why the driver shot at the police. Returning to Australia where one person is dead, another wounded after a knife attack in broad daylight. A 21-year-old man has been arrested after a stabbing rampage in Sydney in the CBD. The suspect seen there jumping on a car trying to resist capture by passerby. Police tried to corner the suspect, demanding that he drop the knife, as you can hear there. At one point, he can be heard shouting, shoot me, I want to die. But it was members of the public who finally apprehended uh, that attacker, using chairs, you can see, and a milk crate to pin him down. Police say the suspect has a history of mental illness and is not linked to any terrorist group. Well, authorities in Malaysia may have found the body of a missing Irish teenager. 15-year-old Nora Kwa Rin was staying with her parents at a resort in a rainforest when she went missing more than a week ago. Her family says she has disabilities, d developmental disabilities, and never went anywhere by herself. The UK charity that has been helping the family says authorities found a young woman's body near the resort 
but it can't yet confirm that it is Nora. Well, still to come here at the international desk, CNN is exposing a private secret army doing the bidding of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Our Clarissa Ward joins us next with her exclusive report. I got a certain way I like to do things. I like consumer cellular. I get unlimited talk and text for just $25 a month with no contract. They received the JD Power Award for highest customer service again. And consumer cellular has been an approved AARP provider since 2008, so we trust them. Reliable nationwide coverage for way less money. That's the way we like it. Get wireless the way you like it. Call, go online, or find us at Target. As this magnificent species edges closer to extinction, illegal hunting continues to rise. Are you ready to let her go? For a gift of $8 a month, you can symbolically adopt a snow leopard and help protect them and other endangered species and their habitats. Call now or go online to helpwwf.org and receive this adoption kit as thanks. Will you stand by her? Please. Help us stop the killing today. The passion of sport. The pressure of competition. The focus it demands. When you're in that ring for that 90 seconds, everything else just kind of fades away. You're focused on you and your horse. Follow all of the drama in the Longines Global Champions Tour and Global Champions League. As the best show jumpers in the world compete for the top prize. CNN Equestrian, Global Champions, Saturday on CNN. Well, U.S. stocks are rallying after the U.S. announced it would delay implementing some tariffs on Chinese goods. Let's take a look at that live board. You can see the Dow up over 400 points. That's more than 1.5%. The U.S. says it will delay tariffs until mid-December on products like cell phones, laptops, computers, video game consoles and some clothing items. Well, Russia is touting its new missile technology despite the apparent explosion of a nuclear-powered test missile last week. The Kremlin spokesman told reporters Tuesday that Russia is, quote, far ahead of other countries in developing advanced weapons. He was responding to a tweet from U.S. President Donald Trump who said the U.S. is learning from Moscow's failed missile test the only official word from Moscow on the mysterious blast last week is that five nuclear scientists are dead. CNN's Frederick Plankton has more. Confusion and concern about a mysterious explosion and a missile test gone wrong that some now fear could be the worst Russian nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. Moscow acknowledges a blast took place at a naval range last week but won't say whether it was nuclear. Instead, they're saying liquid fuel caught fire during trials in the Arctic North, leading to the blast. Local authorities initially said they recorded a short-term spike in radiation levels, but their statement was later deleted. And the defense ministry claims no dangerous substances were released after the explosion. But tonight, experts tell CNN satellite images appear to show that the Russians have sent a special nuclear fuel carrier ship to the area. That ship is used to carry nuclear fuel, and Russia in the past has used that ship to transport the radioactive reactor unit from the nuclear-powered cruise missile. Russia's state-run nuclear agency did admit that five of its employees were killed in the blast. 
A chain of tragic accidents happened. Although our preliminary analysis indicates they were fighting to get the situation under control, unfortunately, that failed. Last year, Vladimir Putin revealed Russia is testing nuclear-powered cruise missiles to counter NATO's missile defense systems. Now that the missile launch and ground tests were successful, we can begin developing a completely new type of weapon, a strategic nuclear weapon system with a nuclear-powered missile. If this was nuclear, it would not be the first time Moscow muddled its messaging after a potential nuclear mishap. In 1986, the Soviet Union didn't acknowledge the Chernobyl disaster until Western nations detected heightened radiation levels in Europe. You will need to move quickly and you will need to move carefully. Thousands of people died in the aftermath of that meltdown, which is now the subject of the HBO series Chernobyl. And in 2000, Moscow kept its own public in the dark about the sinking of the Kursk nuclear submarine, killing all 118 sailors on board, leading to harsh criticism of then-new Russian President Vladimir Putin. More questions than answers remain, as Vladimir Putin's office still has not commented at all on the explosion leaving Russians and the world guessing how dangerous the aftermath might be. Fred Plaikin, CNN, Moscow. Well, now to a CNN exclusive report exposing a secretive private army that does the bidding of Russian President Vladimir Putin. We have learned this private army is expanding, apparently led by a close Putin ally that is linked to U.S. election interference. Our chief international correspondent, Clarissa Ward, joins us now from London. Incredible reporting by you and the team. Clarissa, I understand uh, you have been investigating this for, for quite some time. That's right, Linda. It's really been the better part of a year that Sebastian Shukla, Tim Lister, and myself have been working on this story and trying to find out more about Russia's increasing use of mercenaries across the world, often in unstable countries. They're being used to boost uh, Russia's influence, also to outmaneuver geopolitical rivals like the U.S. And officially, the Kremlin says it has nothing to do with these mercenary groups whatsoever. But we sat down with one in a television vision first. Uh, we've called him Oleg, and he told us a very different story. This is Oleg. For years, he says he worked as a hired gun in Syria for a shadowy Russian mercenary group called Wagner that has become a valuable tool for the Kremlin. Wagner is Putin's instrument for resolving issues by force, when action has to be taken immediately, urgently, and in the most concealed way possible. I cannot say it's an army in the proper sense of that word. It's just a fighting unit that will do anything that Putin says. This is the first time a former Wagner employee has agreed to speak on camera, and Oleg asked us to disguise his identity. Private military contractors are illegal in Russia. Officially, Wagner doesn't exist. But CNN has discovered that the group now has hundreds of fighters operating on three different continents. And this is the man believed to be behind that expansion. Dubbed Putin's chef because of lucrative catering contracts with the Kremlin, Yevgeny Prigozhin is also sanctioned by the U.S. for funding the Internet Research Agency accused of meddling in the 2016 election. I'm a mercenary, and 90% of participants of the company were like me, and they were motivated by money. What sort of training was it? Where did it take place? You know, I didn't have any training as such. Not then, anyway. I spent six days in the training camp in Molkino. I went to a firing range twice and shot a machine gun once. That was it. CNN traveled to the remote Russian village of Molkino to try to get to Wagner's training camp and found that the group has a surprisingly close relationship with the Russian military. The only way to get into the Wagner barracks is to get through that checkpoint which is manned by the Russian military because this actually belongs to a Russian special forces unit. Not far from Malkino, there's a monument to fallen Wagner fighters. Visitors are not welcome, so we approach with a hidden camera. It looks less like a memorial than a fortress. A guard soon comes up to us. 
Wagner. Is the church only for Wagner, I ask? I don't know for whom, he says. For the people who were in Syria, I press him? I don't know, I'm telling you, he says. I'm just guarding here. He begins to get suspicious of our questions, and we decide to leave. Yeah, he's gonna call, let's go. They didn't let us inside, uh, which is not surprising, because in that compound is the only tangible, visible proof that Wagner is real. No surprise, perhaps, that the monument is funded by a Prigozhin-owned company. It was five years ago in Crimea that mysterious unidentified fighters dubbed Little Green Men helped Moscow wrest the province from Ukraine even as the Kremlin feigned ignorance. It was a success, and Moscow's use of mercenary forces has since grown. Analysts say none of this could happen without Putin's approval. Do you think that part of the mission of Wagner is to help Russia restore its role to become a major global superpower again? Yes, 100 percent. This is the top priority for Wagner. And so it's trying to be a rival to America? Russia is trying to suppress the U.S. in every way possible, using legal and illegal means. It's trying to smash it, get the better of it somehow. What will come of it as a result? Nothing good, I think. But for Russian President Vladimir Putin, Wagner is still a worthwhile gamble, an expendable fighting force with no accountability. CNN has tried to reach out to Yevgeny Prigozhin. We have not heard any response from his lawyers. We also wanted, of course, to contact Wagner, but because the group doesn't officially exist, it has no address, no website, and no phone number. And finally, Linda, we also tried to get some comment from the Russian Ministry of Defense. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we got no response there, too. Yeah, no doubt you didn't expect to hear from them, but I understand you are now the subject of a Russian propaganda video. As a result of your reporting, where is it being shown and what does it contain? So essentially, Linda, this is a 15-minute propaganda piece alleging that me and the team that I worked with, Tim and Seb, among others, uh, are, Russia, are, are spies who bribed people to say negative things about the Russians while we were in the Central African Republic. And we were in the Central African Republic for the second part of our series, which will be airing across CNN tomorrow. But what's alarming here, uh, aside from the obvious, is the fact that quite often you can see they have been filming us uh, secretly, uh, wh whether we were at the airport, in our hotel. Uh, there's another scene where someone is in uh, a, our hotel room after we left, saying that uh, this is where Clarissa was sitting when she offered me $100 to speak negatively about Russians. Not only is this baseless lies, uh, but really it's quite sinister. Uh, and it, one can only assume this means that our reporting really did hit a nerve, Linda. Yeah, it certainly did. A great job to you and your team there. Thanks so much, Clarissa Ward. And I just wanted to point out, as Clarissa said, uh, the next uh, story in this series is tomorrow, where Clarissa is investigating Russia's advances in the Central African Republic. They traveled to a Russian-controlled mine where the mission appeared to be less transparent. We are on our way to one of seven sites where a Russian company has been given exploration rights. One of the challenges of trying to nail down exactly what the Russians are doing here is that once you get outside the capital, this is still a very dangerous and chaotic country. And just last year, three Russian journalists were actually ambushed and killed while working on a story about Russian mercenaries. Well, Clarissa's report on Russia's activities inside the Central African Republic is Tuesday at 7 p.m. in New York. That's 11 p.m. London time only on CNN. We're still ahead at the international desk. Lingering questions following Jeffrey Epstein's death in a U.S. jail. Just how closely were the guards watching him? And is a member of the British royal family caught up in this scandal? is a five-hour drive from the capital Hanoi, located high in the remote mountains of northern Vietnam.
But that doesn't mean visitors coming here have to rough it. This is the town's newest five-star hotel, and one of its biggest, the palatial and hard-to-miss Hotel de la Coupole. The DNA of the hotel is the nostalgia of the French Indochine era of the early 1900s. French haute couture fashion, blending with vibrant hill tribe ethnic colors and patterns. That's why they use locally made cotton embroidery on staff uniforms and display ornaments like these, inspired by Hmong jewelry. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. It all starts here. Changing, fighting, creating, connecting. That's why we're here. We live here, we work here, we're from here. And we'll go wherever the story takes us. I'm Becky Anderson in Tehran. We are in Jerusalem. Real news that shapes our world. Exploring not just what's going on, but why. I just want to press you on one further point. Getting perspective on this region from this region. Places that many of us know, but few of us get to see. Observing countries on the move, still rooted in tradition. It all starts here, and that's why we're here. Bringing you the world from our Middle Eastern hub. Connect the world with Becky Anderson, today on CNN. I'm Eleni Jokos, and this is CNN. Welcome back to the International Desk. I'm Linda Kincaid. Good to have you with us. Well, three days after accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in a U.S. jail, there are growing questions about how closely he was being guarded. Workers say the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York is severely understaffed because of federal budget cuts and at least one of the employees on duty was not a regular guard. Well, the FBI agents are now searching a Caribbean island owned by Epstein. U.S. officials say his death will not end the investigation into his alleged crimes or his accused co-conspirators. The Epstein investigation is also raising serious questions in Britain. Our Max Foster is standing by in London and joins us now. And Max, Prince Andrew, the brother of Prince Charles, has been linked to Epstein. Just explain how. Well, he's a former friend, a former associate. There are images of them together. They clearly were close at one point, but uh, we're told not close anymore. Uh, this is a case that just keeps coming back to haunt Prince Andrew and the royal family when a few years ago, actually, the case against him was struck out in a U.S. court. Business as usual, it seems, for Prince Andrew, pictured on Sunday riding alongside the Queen on their way to church. A bold show of support, perhaps, as new details place a spotlight on allegations of sexual misconduct laid against the British royal. Hundreds of pages of previously sealed court filings were released on Friday, bringing to light fresh allegations which have linked the Duke of York to his former friend and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, who was found dead in his prison cell on Saturday. At the heart of the documents connected to a 2015 defamation case are allegations by Virginia Roberts Guffrey, who claims Epstein kept her as a teenage sex slave. Guffrey, pictured here with a prince, says Epstein forced her to perform sex acts with a number of prominent men, including the Duke of York in 2001. Now, court documents detail fresh allegations that the British royal groped another young woman at Epstein's Manhattan mansion. The other woman, who has alleged abuse at the hands of Epstein, claims she was forced into sexual acts with Prince Andrew at Epstein's New York City home, where she says Guffrey participated as well. Buckingham Palace has repeatedly denied the allegations, telling CNN that any suggestion of impropriety with underage minors is categorically untrue. However, in a statement to CNN in July, the palace confirmed that the Duke of York met with Epstein in 2010, 
describing the encounter as an unwise decision on the part of the prince. Whilst the royal family has in the past not been forthcoming in responding to such allegations, the Duke of York took to the World Economic Forum in 2015 to reiterate the palace's steadfast denial of underage sex allegations. And I just wish to uh, reiterate and to reaffirm the statements which have already been made on my behalf by Buckingham Palace. As these unsealed court filings shed new light on the lurid details of the Epstein scandal, questions surrounding the involvement of the financier's high-profile associates are beginning to mount. While Epstein's death brought the federal criminal case against him to an abrupt end, the scandal is far from over, and prosecutors could still pursue related criminal cases involving the financier's many associates. Uh, one co-conspirator, as alleged by some of his victims, is uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. She is also potentially here in the UK. That's the speculation, at least, because US investigators are struggling to locate her. We understand she was described by Epstein as his best friend, but is featured in many of the photos, including the one uh, of Prince Andrew that you saw there in that piece. Mm, it's certainly intriguing. Max Foster, good to have you on the story. Thanks so much. Well, Canadian police believe two murder suspects who triggered a nationwide manhunt have died by suicide. The autopsy report confirms the teens' identities and says both were dead for a number of days before they were found last week. It brings an end to the weeks-long search for answers in a triple homicide investigation. Well, deadly storms are creating havoc in Asia. In eastern China, at least 44 people were killed, 16 are missing after Typhoon Lakima made a second landfall along the country's coast. Torrential rain and gale force winds forced buildings to collapse. You can see there the force of the water. State media reported nearly 5 million were hit by the floods. More than 1 million people had to be evacuated. The typhoon is the ninth one to hit China this year. Well, a dire warning. I've got a dire warning from a new report on climate crisis. Greenhouse gases reaching record levels in 2018. And last year, of course, was also the fourth hottest year on record. Well, let's go to CNN meteorologist Chad Myers for more on all of this. And Chad, this was a pretty significant report. Uh, 475 right. scientists from almost Correct. 60 countries contributed to it. Certainly a lot to unpack and really not any good news. No, this was really a physical of the earth, you know, stick out your tongue and say ah no no opinions here this was data driven facts that they could put together from this and we know that we're adding more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year we know that 2018 was going to be and knew it was going to be a record we know 2019 will be another we know 2020 will be another and probably all the way up to 2030 before we can take more co2 out than we put in fourth hottest year on record and it started as a La Nina which should have made it cooler 70,000 record highs and only 30,000 record lows annually so the numbers keep going up we keep dumping CO2 methane and all the like into the atmosphere and the ocean and the plants can't take it out fast enough so these numbers are going to continue to go up in 2018 the average was 407 so right now where were we we were at 415 in May. Now that the North Northern Hemisphere is growing more, that number is down to 410, but still we're already above 418. So we're already, we're already above 2018. So we'll know that this weather is just going to keep going up and the world's going to keep getting hotter because we should be somewhere around 300, not above 400. And that's the rub. We are warming the atmosphere. We know what's happening. We know man is making it and we can't figure out why some people can't figure that out. Electricity and heat production, 25%. Just warming or cooling your house. Growing things, eating beef, cattle, whatever, cows, 24% what, of that number. So we talk about, oh, you're not going to be able to drive your car anymore. You know, transportation is only 14% of the equation. There's a lot more going in here than what just meets the eye. So sea level's going up. It's already gone up now 81 millimeters since 1993. That's three inches, and it's still going up and it will continue to rise. 
until we can stop putting more CO2 than we can take out. Linda. Yeah, certainly a lot to unpack and uh, clearly yep. not enough being done about this. Chad Myers, not good yet. to have you with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, still to come here at the International Desk, is there a cure for Ebola? There's fresh hope after two new treatments proved highly effective in Congo. We'll have a live report next. I fell in love with the culture and heritage of Hanoi. It has four UNESCO World Heritage Awards, but what's really incredible about it is the mix of this thousand-year-old historic town and a new modern city. There's a wealth of nostalgia in Hanoi's old quarter. You can enjoy peace at Pong Kiem Lake and discover history at the Imperial Citadel. It's my gateway to the rest of Vietnam. Hanoi, the cradle of heritage. I'm Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. You called what Jeff Bezos has built a miracle. Absolute miracle. Amazon, it's everywhere in your life. Amazon's become an invasive species. Let's take over. What's the real cost of your cart? I think they have monopoly power. Company insiders talk with CNN. They say that you are the most powerful man in the cloud. Who at Amazon hears what I tell Alexa when I'm talking to her? CNN Special Report, The Age of Amazon, Friday on CNN. We live in such a fast-paced world where the news has been so relentless. Historic events have happened one after the other. I think that you need that daily appointment with viewers around the world to try and sort through the news of the day. What's important? Why does it matter to me? How do I put it all in context? We follow the news as it happens and where it happens. And then we also take a step back to walk the viewer through the day's news. That is the mission of Halagarani tonight. Welcome back. Scientists are a step closer to being able to cure the deadly virus Ebola. Two new treatments appear to show promise. The experimental drugs are being tried on infected patients in the Democratic Republic of Congo. A devastating outbreak there has killed more than 1,800 people in the past year. Well, for more, let's go to scene. And David McKenzie, he joins us now from Johannesburg, South Africa. And David, uh, great news really, these drugs showing up to a 90% survival rate. The key, of course, being early detection and treatment. Well, isn't that an extraordinary number? And it is great news. And the fact that you could have patients who come in quickly to the treatment centers and uh, only 10% of them will die is still not acceptable, but certainly much better than we've seen in Ebola outbreaks like this one and in past outbreaks. Uh, currently, the death rate in this devastating outbreak in the Northeast Congo is 70%. These uh, trials were started, randomized drug trials in November. Two of the drugs developed in the US that use synthetic antibodies to attack the virus have just been massively successful in these early trials, so much so that they had to abandon the trial and they are giving everybody who can get to those treatment centers these drugs from here on out. So yes, it's a really strong ray of hope in what has been a very difficult uh, response to this particular outbreak. It really is wonderful news. I would love to discuss it more, but we have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much, David McKenzie, for us in Johannesburg. Well, I'm Linda Kincaid. That was the International Desk. Stay with us. World Sport with Amanda Davis is coming up after a quick break. Are you glad for innovation? Things that used to be big and bulky now fit in your pocket. <laughs> Even your hose from the makers of the number one expandable hose in the world comes another amazing pocket hose, the Silver Bullet. It's making other hoses obsolete. Look, that old hose is a pain in the grass, but the new Silver Bullet is the hassle-free hose. Just turn on the water and the Silver Bullet inflates from pocket size to super size. It's the hands-free hose that grows. Then turn off the water, and it shrinks back down to a super light pocket hose. It's putting itself away. The other hose? 
just sits there. No more dragon heavy hoses. No flipping and whipping to clear the kinks. The silver bullet will never kink. Look at that. I mean, that's a kink. And look at the water pressure. A silver bullet stores with ease. Perfect for boats or RVs. Look, your old hose and my silver bullet. Your old hose, my silver bullet. The exclusive bullet shell outer casing resists snagging, tearing, and wearing. It easily maneuvers around the garden without crushing your plants. And the silver bullet has no lead. These machine aluminum connectors make it safe for drinking. It's the lightest hose I've ever owned. Come on, dump the heavy old hose and get the bullet. Get the super light 25 foot pocket hose silver bullet today for only $19.99. Guaranteed to last a lifetime or your money back. You'll also get the turbo shot jet nozzle free. Now hold on, order now and you can double your order. Just pay a separate fee. Two hoses, two nozzles, one great deal. Stop wrestling with your old hose and catch a silver bullet today. Call 1-800-418-1641. That's 1-800-418-1641. Call or visit silverbullethose.com. So call 1-800-418-1641 now. Hi, thanks for joining us. Welcome along to World Sport Live from London with me, Amanda Davis. It's just over a month ago that England's cricket team were in action at Lord's winning the World Cup in the most dramatic of fashions. And whilst they're now focusing on the five-day game rather than the one-day format, they'll be looking to channel a bit of that feeling and fighting spirit as they prepare to take on Australia in the second Ashes Test, which starts on Wednesday at Lords. The Aussie coach, Justin Langer, admitted his side got lucky in the 251-run first Test win after England lost influential record wicket-taker James Anderson after just four overs through injury. But that doesn't take away from the impressive twin centuries from former captain Steve Smith and fantastic day five bowling performance from Nathan Lyon and a win that very much gives Australia the upper hand in their quest to retain the famous little urn in the five match series. Well, the highs and lows of recent weeks for England cricket have been embodied by opening batsman Jason Roy. His impressive performance to help England win the World Cup saw him named in England's test side for the first time and then immediately catapulted into the lineup as England opening batsman for the first Ashes test, which didn't exactly go to plan. He made just 38 runs across his two innings. But as former England batsman Nick Compton found out when he went to speak to Roy at Lords ahead of the second test, events in Birmingham haven't dampened those memories of that World Cup success. Jason, we're back here at Lords, the scene of uh, England's epic World Cup victory. Yeah. How does it feel like to be back? A lot more sober than the <laughs> last time I left the place, but uh, it's an incredible place that holds in my heart now. It's kind of a surreal feeling and has been over the last few weeks, still a very surreal feeling. Just going back to that day, I, I know you were at the other side of the boundary yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, New Zealand needed two runs to win. Yeah. Did you want the balls come to you? Well, we <laughs> <laughs> Yes and no. I, I think yes, and then the ball's coming towards you, and then you're, yeah, you're, you're pretty nervous. Um, everything went silent. The ball was going in slow motion. The only thing that seemed to be going at the same pace was the batsmen. They were running at the speed of light, and I was just seeing them in my peripheral vision. And yeah, I was bricking it really. I was at Trafalgar Square actually, so oh, I wasn't wow. even here, and I can attest to the fact that it was unbelievable. There's 10, 11,000 people there, people from all walks of life, different yeah. countries. So that was the best thing about the whole thing was when we saw the videos. Made Maybe two, three days later of Trafalgar Square, little creek clubs around the country, um, and pe the pe people's elation over what just happened was probably the most heartwarming thing about the whole whole win. You've had a family, you've had a kid, yeah. you've, you've done it all. Um, how have you managed to balance all of that? It obviously is a huge blessing, but I think for my cricket as well, just just the fact that I've, I'm able to switch off completely, I'm able to kind of get home, completely leave the game in the changing room, um, and look after my family. And it's kind of, I don't know, in a weird way, giving me a bit of a more of a purpose. I think you can kind of get wrapped up in, especially international cricket, the the big bubble that you're in, and forget about the real world and. Um, I think it's just opened my eyes up a huge amount. Let's go into your style a little bit in yeah. terms of now transitioning to, to test cricket, to, yeah. to the red ball. You obviously haven't opened a huge amount in red ball cricket, but no. are you finding that experience? 
it's a different experience. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the ball being a different color is the main one, but it, you know what? It's actually a bit more relaxing. Um, not going out there and having to score at six, seven, yeah. eight, and over from ball one, and and just being able to go out there and just enjoy yourself. In terms of that first test, obviously you had a, a, a pretty poor loss in the end. I mean, you're coming into the yeah. second test. Yeah, are there a couple of changes you might make or any tactical changes? I did that in the, in the second innings. Obviously, I had a bit of a I don't know. I wouldn't say Russian blood, but there was a lot of thought behind the shot. Um, it just didn't come off, but I really enjoyed it out there. It was a good battle. Um, they were getting stuck into me, bowling some good deliveries, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm enjoying the craftsmanship behind Test Cricket so far. I had the uh, fortunate pleasure of opening the batting with Alistair Cook walking down through the long room. I know you're going to do that hopefully on Wednesday if the rain stays off, but doing it with one of your good mates, Rory Burns, how's that going to feel? Incredible. Um, we obviously did it here against Ireland, and I can't imagine what it's going to be like against Australia um, and to do it with Burns you know he's, he's worked so hard to be where he's at I've grown up with him since I was 10 years old um, and to be putting my wide on and walking out next to him is, is such a huge honor and, and it's, it's something we'll talk talk about for the rest of our lives so it's pretty cool that was uh, Jason Roy talking to former England batsman Nick Compton for us. Uh, up next, though, what is the difference between good and great? We've got someone who's discovered the secret coming your way, the greatest female boxer of all time, Katie Taylor. As this magnificent species edges closer to extinction, illegal hunting continues to rise. Are you ready to let her go? For a gift of $8 a month, you can symbolically adopt a snow leopard and help protect them and other endangered species and their habitats. Call now or go online to helpwwf.org and receive this adoption kit as thanks. Will you stand by her? Please. Help us stop the killing today. Welcome back. The boxing headlines this week have been dominated by news of the rematch said to take place between Anthony Joshua and Andy Ruiz Jr. in Saudi Arabia. A fight that will see Joshua attempt to win back the belts he lost in June to once again become boxing's unified heavyweight champion. Becoming unified champion across the weight division is the target that so many boxers can only dream about. But it's one that Ireland's Katie Taylor has managed to achieve. She's an Olympic champion, the undisputed world champion, and as she told us recently, she wants to be remembered as the greatest female boxer of her generation. Boxing is more than hitting someone. It's about um, courage and beauty, uh, the beauty of the technical side where you, that, that you see in great fighters, but also the honesty and courage that you see when the fight is dragged into the trenches. To me, boxing means destiny, the arena in which uh, all my biggest dreams and battles have been played out, and it's in the arena where I've learned the most about myself as well and what I'm made of. My passion for boxing comes from a genuine belief that this is what I was born to do. I felt since I was six or seven years of age that I was born to box. And uh, even since uh, that age, I, I had a dream of becoming an Olympic champion. And um, and thankfully, I, I fulfilled that childhood dream in 2012. And ever since I turned professional, I had a dream to become the undisputed champion. I, I achieved that as well. And this is absolutely what I was born to do. It's amazing to live in the life that I was called to. To be a great fighter, you must be willing to go where good fighters won't. I think um, there's both a thin line between the good and the great, um, between abilities and talent, but also a great gulf between heart and attitude. Before a big fight, I'm thinking what I need to do to win the fight. I try to block everything else out. 
When I put my clothes on, I feel like I'm putting God's purpose on for my life. When I step into the ring, I feel privileged that my passion is my job. Um, I wake up every single day and I absolutely love what I do. I'm, I'm doing something that I absolutely love and um, I never take that for granted, even though some days I'm not in the mood for training, but I absolutely love my job and this is where my passion is and it's an absolute privilege to, to be living this life. After a win, I feel joy, uh, relief, satisfaction, um, and then an hour later, I'm thinking about the next fight. <laughs> when I look at all my belts, I feel pride. Um, I feel like all, all this is so worthwhile, all the sacrifices that I've made is so worthwhile, and um, I just feel great joy with uh, all the sacrifices that me and my family have made um, has been all worth it. My ultimate goal is to be the greatest female boxer of my generation and um, to build a bigger platform for the next female fighters as well. What a fascinating character with such an inspirational story. You can learn much more about Katie Taylor in a Connect the World special program right here on CNN. It airs on Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. London time. But that's it from myself and the team for this edition of World Sport. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Goodbye. If you just want a slice of pizza, you don't buy the whole pie. So if you don't use your cell phone that much, why pay for more than you need? For as low as $20 a month, you can get talk, text, and data from Consumer Cellular with no contract and connections on the nation's largest wireless networks. You'll also receive award-winning support. Consumer Cellular has received the J.D. Power Award for highest customer service again. Plus, AARP members get exclusive discounts. Switch to Consumer Cellular today. With our 30-day guarantee, it's completely risk-free. Call, go online, or find us at Target. This is Kate. Hey. She takes two prescriptions. Kate's son, Jack, takes one too. Kate works hard and thought she had good insurance, but she still pays too much. That's no good. So Kate downloaded the GoodRx app. Now she can compare prescription prices to find the best discounts. She even beats her insurance price. Good for you, Kate. Good for you. GoodRx, stop paying too much for your prescriptions. Download the free app today. On the next Vital Signs, a growing beef with beef. Our mission is very simple, to completely replace animals as a food technology. Now, meat made from plants. It's this quest to have it look like the meat that we're used to. It'll be distinguishable. This really looks and smells just like a beef burger. And on the horizon, steak grown in a lab. With very few cells, we can grow infinite amount of meat. But will consumers bite? On the next Vital Signs, Wednesday on CNN. Weekdays on CNN. Welcome to the lead. I'm Jake Tapper. We're going to begin with the politics lead and one of the biggest bombshells today. The straight talk you need. That seems to be, to me, completely contradicting. From your man in Washington. It's all food for thought when you and the public are trying to decide who to trust. Who won't back down. We're getting a new look at the headwinds that congressional Republicans already are facing. A monumental day in our politics. The lead with Jake Tapper today on CNN. unpredictable environment and news races around the world at breakneck speed.
I didn't know what his intention was. I knew it could be obstruction of justice. My show brings you the latest news and top news makers. Are you playing with fire? And we also dive below the headlines to explore vital issues impacting our lives. It's about right and wrong. You have to stand up for what you believe in. We need to realize that our future is at risk and we need to take action. Was that kind of mortifying or did you enjoy I mean, you were great. It's <laughs> crucial we make sense of what's happening. Do you regret that? Do you think there should be nuclear power or more commitment to a clean environment? New Zealand had its experience and changed its laws. To be honest with you, I do not understand the United States. Does love have a chance of winning? I will always believe that. And fully understand what's at stake. Amanpour, today on CNN. I'm David McKenzie in Goma, Eastern DRC, and this is CNN. Excuse me, miss, who dropped this? It was just a penny. Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first check or cashing big checks, every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. is a network of wonder and hope <laughs> created by global storytellers a new way to see the world this is great big story Recruiting for Epstein in newly unsealed documents. We are finding out more about a woman who allegedly procured young victims for the wealthy sex offender. And she moves in very high society here in the UK. All the details in just a moment. Then, Putin's private army. Wagner is Putin's instrument for resolving issues by force when action has to be taken immediately, urgently, and in the most concealed way possible. I cannot say it's an army in the proper sense of that word. It's just a fighting unit that will do anything that Putin says. In reporting only right here on CNN, we uncover a secret private army that does whatever the Russian president tells it to do. We'll show you where it is 